From Psalm 1, I would like to address this theme of how to survive the storms of life. Maybe I mention it's Christmas time, and you'll be with family, and won't that be great? (laughs) Uh, Always, right? Never a conflict. Maybe someone has put it like this, you can choose your friends. Your family, that's what God gives you. Uh, And at times, that's easy and great, but at other times... We don't get to choose the trials in this life that we face. In fact, this is what we find in the Psalter on every page. We find nearly every human emotion expressed within the collection of 150 psalms. And often the psalms will be that which encourages us to praise the Lord, to turn our hearts toward Him in thanksgiving for all the blessings that come our way. But other psalms, have you noticed, are psalms of lament. Not every day is a good day. And it's okay to admit that because the scriptures admit that, that there are trials and difficulties. And at times, ultimately, God brings those trials and he's using those trials to conform us to the image of his son. One reader of the Psalms has observed that the Psalms often begin with God and his throne, all is right in the universe, He is to be praised, and you even feel like praising Him. You are rejoicing in thanksgiving. And he calls this orientation, the world, the way it ought to be. But other times, you find psalms when David is running for his life from King Saul, who wants to kill him. Things are not going well. It is not a good day. And we might call these psalms, psalms of disorientation, where The world is not the way it should be. We are living in a fallen universe where sin has entered the world with all of its destructive force. And yet, as you would keep reading the Psalms, we can be directed to what this author has called reorientation. You see, keep reading. Keep reading. Because even though times are difficult, even though trials and temptations come, and even though God's people fall into sin. Repentance is possible. Reorientation is possible. And God is able to restore what the moths have eaten. He is able to redeem that which is lost. And He can reorient our thinking to be upon Him. He is steadfast. He is on His throne. It reminds me of the person who was asked, "Uh, how are you doing today? And he said, well, pretty well under the circumstances. And his friend said, what are you doing under there? (laughs) Under the circumstances. You see, the circumstances need not determine even how you are doing today because you, through God's word, can be reoriented to focus upon him on his throne, in control, directing even the events of your lives. This is how... God's people then turn over and over to the Psalter as a book which reorients ourselves to God and His rule and reign. In fact, Psalm 1 opens the Psalter to us as a collection of 150 psalms or praises. That's the name of the book in Hebrew. We call it the book of Psalms as if it is a collection of songs, and yet these songs are collectively known as praises in Hebrew, the word tehillim for the psalms as a whole, uh, provide us with the same root that you already know in the word hallelujah. Hallel means to praise, and hallelujah, can I get grammatical with you a little bit this morning? Uh, we're all going to be needing to learn more pronouns, so might as well learn a biblical pronoun. It's the oo in hallelujah. This forms a sentence, hallel, praise. Oo is the second common plural pronoun. It's, it's like y'all. I was new to North Carolina when they informed me of the plural of y'all, it's all y'all. And, and that's kind of like the ooh in Hebrew. Hallel ooh. All y'all praise Yah, short for Yahweh. 
So this is the word, which is more than a word. It's an entire sentence, and it is a command form sentence. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. And this is a collection of those tehillim, these praises, which help God's people in our good times and in bad to praise the Lord and to be reminded of this biblical command to praise Him even when life seems so disoriented. Psalm 1, then, is the introduction to this entire collection of praises that describe for us the type of person who will sing these praises, who will memorize them, who will ponder their lyrics, obey them, pray them back to God, tell them to others, and apply these truths to our very lives. Psalm 1, then, introduces us to the type of person who is blessed to have these truths. In fact, Psalm 1 and 2 together can be viewed as a set of double doors that open us to the Psalter. Psalm 1 is that first handle that you grab, but Psalm 2 is a second chapter worth of introduction to the 150 Psalms that point us ultimately to God's Son, the Anointed One, about whom we read from Hebrews chapter 1 earlier. And it points us to the one who ultimately is able to bring blessing about to God's Son. And so when we come to the Psalms, in our time of need, we really aren't the first ones to ever turn to the Psalter for help. Gerald Wilson, in his commentary on the Psalms, puts it well. He says, thus, whenever you read the Psalms, when you sing them or pray them, you are praying, singing, and reading alongside a huge crowd of faithful witnesses throughout the ages. These words you speak have been spoken thousands, even millions of times before in Hebrew, in Greek, in Latin, and in a myriad of other languages. As you read or sing or pray, off to your right hand stand Moses and Miriam. And in front of you, Kings David and Solomon kneel down. Off to your left, Jesus, Peter, and Paul, Priscilla, and Aquila, and many others, they also have read the Psalms and found God's encouragement. While from behind come the voices of people like Nicodemus and Zacchaeus and Joseph of Arimathea, or people throughout church history, and even more important than the fact that Luther and Calvin and other reformers may have read from the Psalter, may be more important to you a godly grandmother or a faithful grandfather have read these words before and found God's help in a time of need. This is where the godly go. They often will go and with great historical precedent, they will go to the Psalter to be reoriented in the midst of the storms of life. And that's where I would like to draw your attention today as we look at Psalm chapter 1. And in these first few verses, we begin to look at how to survive the storms of life. And we learn that God's wisdom is the path to survival. Look with me at verses 1 through 3. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does he prospers. This is what the godly is like. And... This reminder, even as it opens with the word, how blessed, you might immediately notice that there is an opposite to how blessed as you read the words of Scripture. In fact, this wording of how blessed points us not only fast forward to the Beatitudes spoken by Jesus, But Jesus is picking up on many things found in yet another poetic book in the Hebrew Scriptures, a wisdom book, the book of Proverbs, which points to those who are blessed by God and those who will be 
cursed. To hear how blessed points us on a path in the direction of God's blessing versus how cursed, if you will, those are who will not follow in God's path. This will come back again and again to us, but already in the first words of this psalm, we're introduced to this wisdom theme. How blessed is the man? Well, how blessed is he? You see, God's wisdom is going to be the path to survival, and that survival is described by what we intentionally avoid. Three times, in fact, in verse 1, you have a negation description. This person is blessed, not because of what he does, immediately in verse 1, but by what he intentionally does not do. And so you find the negative particle repeated three times in verse 1, that he does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, he does not stand in the path of sinners, and he does not sit in the seat of scoffers. Take a look. To intentionally avoid walking in the path or the counsel of the wicked means that he is intentionally avoiding bad advice the counsel. And it's so easy to find bad advice today. I mean, we are regularly bombarded with bad advice. If you did all that you were encouraged to do in various advertisements or various media promotions or, or various social media po posts, we'd probably all be able to greet one another, not only in prison, but ultimately one day in the ultimate prison of hell. Uh, to take bad advice puts you on a bad path with a bad ultimate outcome. But this person who is going to seek God's ways is blessed because of what he refuses. He, he recognizes bad advice and he says, oh, that will not honor God. That will not help others. And it certainly will not help me to follow that bad advice I will avoid this bad, evil counsel. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 24, puts it like this. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsels and the dictates of their evil hearts and went backward, not forward. How many times can we see ourselves going backward? in our walk with the Lord and not forward because we followed bad advice. Perhaps it was the bad advice that came from our own wicked hearts. Perhaps it was the bad advice that was the counsel of bad associates. Well, you see, this is exactly what the blessed person also avoids. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners. You see, it is not only the bad advice of the wicked people, but it is the bad associates themselves when here we are told that the blessed person does not stand in the path of sinners. Here, once again, we find a word that is even more commonly used in the book of Proverbs than in the Psalter. The word path or way it tells us about a person's life direction. Perhaps you're familiar with the fact that Scripture often uses the symbol of a journey to describe the type of life you're living, the direction that you're going, the way that you're on. And there is a very clear distinction in the book of Proverbs between the way of the wicked fool that leads to death and the righteous wise that leads to life. That way, that directional indicator, it tells about the type of person we are. This blessed person does not stand in the path of sinners. The path of sinners is the path, of course, that describes a path not only lined with other sinners, but the path that leads to the sin of the sinners. It is that which describes the lifestyle and life direction filled with sin. But there's a third negation. Survival is described by what we intentionally avoid, namely that we do not walk 
in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way with sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. You see, not only is the bad advice of the wicked to be avoided, not only are the bad associates themselves who would lead us into such wickedness to be avoided, but even the bad attitude that comes by being among those who are described as scoffers to be avoided. To be a scoffer, you know what that means. They not only personally choose against God's ways, but they mock God's ways. They publicly denounce God's ways and therefore scoff. They are known here as scoffers because of their scoffing. They mock and ridicule the truth of God. And here, let's note that these verbs that are describing the blessed person and the choices that the blessed person chooses against are words that are in a sequence of increasing participation in wickedness. Take a look at this digression, if you will. I would say progress, but it's progress in wickedness. So it's a regression, if you will. The, to walk, this describes the direction of your life. You're going in a direction, you're on a journey, you're on a path. But to stand means that you've stopped on your walk. Perhaps here, to stand in the path of sinners or with sinners is that you have now become comfortable with them and you're participating with them on their path. You are, if you will, taking a stand with sinners and with their sin. But it gets worse. To sit, ah, to sit is even greater participation. Perhaps you're reminded of the city gate in the ancient Near Eastern architecture. To sit in the city gate meant that you were one of the rulers of the city. Uh, this is what Proverbs 31 speaks about with a virtuous wife whose husband is known in the gates where he sits with the elders of the town. To sit in the gates means that you will be the ones determining what comes into the city, what goes out of the city. You're holding court there in the city gates, very much like the person who is seated here, but seated with scoffers. The seated position, I hope you're all comfortable, by the way, because it's very different than how Jesus taught his disciples. You'll recall in reading the gospel accounts that Jesus sat down and began to teach them. You know, maybe if I get a little older, I'll be able to sit down and begin to teach my classes. But for now, the students are seated in our culture, and the professor is the one who is standing. But in the biblical world, to be seated is a seat of authority. And to be seated here in the seat of scoffers is the ultimate example description of how much this person is a part of the scoffing. He is seated with them. He not only was walking with them, he not only got comfortable enough to take a stand with them, but now he is seated as a scoffer. But the blessed man is blessed by the very fact that he will not do any of those things. He is resisting even the thought of walking in bad advice, of standing with bad associates, and with sitting with those who have a bad attitude. He is one who is described by what he intentionally avoids, and he is blessed because of it. In fact, survival is further determined by what we intentionally appreciate. In verse 2, look with me at verse 2 where we read, but, and there is a great contrast there, instead of what he does not do, let's learn in verse 2 what he does do, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. To delight has the idea of taking pleasure in something, to desire something that is good, to delight. And to meditate is this word that is used again in chapter 2 where we read, Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? 
The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take their counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, a reference to the anointed king of Israel and the ultimate anointed, capital A, anointed one, the Messiah. That's what the word Messiah means, anointed one. These are the kings who have taken their stand against the Lord's Messiah and anointed one. And they are, verse 2 of chapter 2, devising, plotting, a vain thing. Here is our word for meditate, to plot, to devise, to craft, to think about in an intentional manner. Well, the person who is blessed is one who is not plotting against the Lord, but who is meditating day and night on the Lord's word. In addition to calling this psalm a wisdom psalm because the use of the word the path, the 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 common phrase about the blessed person, like you would read in the book of Proverbs. This psalm has also been called a Torah psalm because the word Torah for God's law is mentioned here in verse 2. This blessed person, his delight is in the law of the Lord. The word law, Torah in Hebrew, means instruction. Later in Psalm 19, we will learn that the godly love God's instruction. In fact, they find it to their taste sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. And for all that eventually we'll learn that there has been a misuse and application of the law, just like there is a misuse of the New Testament by the cults today. So Paul also says, even though people use the law unlawfully and misguide people through wrong teachings of the law, he also is quick to say, but the law itself is good if a man uses it lawfully, 1 Timothy chapter 1. And of course, it is in reference to the law of God that Paul would have been speaking when he said to Timothy from childhood, like even before the New Testament was written, Timothy, you have learned the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise to salvation. And certainly the Torah, God's law, is that which is inspired, which is His first revelation about Himself, His creation, His plan of redemption, His holy character, the need for a sacrifice for sin. God's law, God's instruction teaches us about who God is and our great need for redemption. This blessed person delights in the law of the Lord and in his law meditates day and night. To read these words day and night is a reminder to us of the fact that this is not saying exclusively at the midpoint of the day, the hottest point in the daytime or the darkest point of the night. It's not either midday or midnight. It is a reference to the fact that all the time God's people delight in God's law. Maybe we could put it like this. I think as Stephen had a reference earlier to the Alpha and the Omega, it's the same sort of wordplay known as a merism, where you mention one thing at the beginning of a spectrum and another at the other extreme of the spectrum in order to encompass the whole in between. For instance, Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet, Alpha, and Omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet. But he's also the Alpha Beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, blah, 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 all the way through. If he keeps the omega to the end of it, he's all in all. He is not one or the other. He is not simply daytime or nighttime. He is this type of figure of speech encompasses the whole. When do God's people meditate on God's truth? All the time. It's not just have you had your morning devotions or your nighttime prayers and devotions. Have you, no, are you... Are you living and breathing out the scriptures. And is the scripture alive and at work in your heart and mind all the time? I'm sadly reminded of an example of a dear friend who told me about his father, who as he was raised in a Christian home, his father would regularly read from a little devotional booklet 
say the morning prayer, get up from the table, and go cuss his men out on the farm, unchanged by the scriptures. But he had his morning devotions, you see. Friends, it is not about morning or evening. It's about a lifestyle, an alpha, omega, all-encompassing meditation on the scripture and how it might transform us. You see, the blessed person's delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. You see, when you meditate on Scripture day and night, when you fill your mind and heart with Scripture in your intentional moments, guess what God does with his scriptural truth in the unintentional moments when the trial comes your way? He works out what you've already worked in. He causes you to exude with the truth of Scripture because you've been putting the Scripture in you intentionally. You've been meditating on Scripture, and so when you get poked, guess what comes out? More Scripture. This reminds me of a former student of mine who posted online about a trial he had. He said, took a financial hit today, and it shook me. Maybe some of us have experienced the shock of a financial hit, and it's shaken you as well. He said, so, after a moment of panic, I mean, let's just be honest. Even the psalmists were honest. Not every day is a good day. Uh, not every moment is a, oh, I'm so thankful for that right away. Maybe you're thankful after a while, <laughs> but right away it's a panic. So after a moment of panic, I went to the Lord in prayer. I opened the word and read. And the now was overshadowed by eternity. The promise shone light upon my problems. Nothing has changed. I like that really the most about his post. Because he doesn't say, so I prayed, I opened the word, and then I found a check that I forgot to cash from work. Or my parents bailed me out. Or, you know, I won the lottery. He doesn't say anything has changed. He's still in the midst of this financial crisis. I still don't know what to do next, but I am no longer afraid. The cheesy truth calms my soul. I have Jesus, and that is enough. Friends, this is why the godly go time and time to God's word in our time of trial. We dig the roots deep so that we are unswayed, and that's exactly how the psalmist goes on to describe this path to survival, it's demonstrated by an impressive tree. Take a look at the description of this tree in verse 3. He, the blessed man, will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in the season, and his leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. John Phillips, in his book, Exploring the Psalms, has a five-point outline based upon these very words in verse 3. It's its own sermon. I won't turn it into one, but, but it is its own sermon that he has preached. And notice the five points that come from just verse 3 that speak of this tree and his permanence, firmly planted. Well-rooted. You see, the secret to every tree is its roots. It doesn't matter where our life is planted, lived, or what kind of weather you meet if your roots find the water. This blessed person has found the water of the word. And thus, Phillips goes on to describe his position by streams of water. Certainly this is a reference to that sort of <clears throat> need that every plant has for water. It very well also could have been a reference to the fact that in the ancient Near Eastern world with the geography that the Israelites would have been familiar with, ancient Egypt was the right place. If you could choose anywhere in the ancient Near East, where do you want to be a farmer? Egypt was the top real estate for farming. I mean, think about it. When there was a famine in the land of Canaan, 
where did the patriarchs go? They went down to McPharaoh's to get something to eat. I mean, it was always open. They had the Nile River. This is exactly what God tells Moses to tell the Israelites in a warning about in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 11. The land that you're going, that I'm taking you to, is not like the land of Egypt. No, it's a land of hills and valleys and it drinks water from the rain of heaven. In other words, you're going to need the early and the latter rain all the time. There is no river going right through the land of Israel that will water the crops. For Egypt, on the other hand, and I love to not only take people to these biblical lands to show them in person, but I like to look at Google Earth over Egypt. And as you pan out a bit, you see this barren, God-forsaken wasteland of a desert with rocks everywhere. And then, snaking up from the south, you see the Nile River fanning out into the Nile Delta, dumping out into the Mediterranean. And it's lush and green up against this backdrop of sand and rocks and stone. And the ancients learned how they could extend the water irrigation potential of the Nile for about 5 to 15 miles on either side of the river by digging these canals. And again, Deuteronomy 11 references this when he says it's not like the land of Egypt where you used to water the land like a vegetable garden with your foot. Possibly a reference to a foot pump that they would pump out the water from the Nile and get it into the canal so you could have even more arable land that is farmable 5 to 15 miles on either side of the Nile. The promised land, Canaan, eventually the land of Israel, it wasn't built that way at all. It's not flat. And uh, if you've ever been on a tour of Jerusalem, you're walking uphill both ways to the bus. I mean, uh, it's, it's up and down everywhere. And just think what happens then when the rain comes. It's all washing away. That means you need a constant source of the rainfall to keep the crops growing on the hillsides. You see, the position of this blessed, impressive tree He's by a constant source of water planted by streams. His productivity, it yields its fruit in its season. This is what fruit trees are supposed to do, right? They're supposed to yield fruit. And this tree yields abundantly. This is a symbol of God's blessing when there is fruitfulness, when there is Blessing in the baskets and the kneading bowls, when there is blessings in the field, when there is blessing among the herds and the flocks, when there is blessing. This means that there will be productivity, yielding of fruit. But further, his perpetuity. Here we're told his leaf does not wither. So, in other words, this tree is like an evergreen tree. Most trees actually lose their leaves after they've produced their fruit. These deciduous trees that only have leaves part of the year is not really what is described here. This tree in perpetuity is ever green, even though it yields its fruit. And the godly person is described as staying ever green and ever fruitful. Finally, his prosperity in whatever he does, he prospers. The idea here is of turning out well because of God's blessing. It's in whatever he does, he prospers, not because he's so internally prosperous. It's because this is the person who's, well, as the text describes him, firmly planted by streams of water. He gets his nourishment from God himself who produces the fruit so that his leaf does not wither. He is perpetually protected by the Lord and prospers. This reminds me of exactly what we see in the landscape of Israel. Here in the southwest of the landscape of the promised land is the area known as the Negev Desert. Particularly here you see this green snaky path. This is the famous 
wadi, or seasonal stream bed, known as Wadi Zin. And it is very much a possibility that when the psalmist here in verse 3 refers to the streams of water, he's not talking about some big canal or a river-like constant motion water by which the tree is firmly planted. But this phrase, palge maim, the streams of water, could very well refer to the underground aquifers that are still moistening the roots of the tree even when the visible water on the surface is long gone. Friends, maybe it's like that for you. Where, look, when you're at a church service and you're hearing the word and God is at work in your life through the word and you're singing his praises, you want to be a godly husband or wife. You want to be a godly young person. You want to be a godly employee. You want to be godly with your uh, staff and those around you. But you know, five minutes after this service is over, things could be a little different. A curveball could come your way. Uh, a phone call that you're not expecting. Uh, news that you didn't want. Or someone else annoying you in a way that you would prefer they didn't. Who likes to be annoyed? <laughs> the question is not whether or not storms will come. Storms always come. And this is why God's word is forever relevant. Look, you either just came out of a trial or you're in one right now. And if you're not, guess what could happen tomorrow? I mean, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but trials come. And trials often reveal what is true about our character. If you want the trials to reveal through God's refinement and testing that He is keeping you and you are keeping hold of Him through His Word, then dig in your roots deep to the power source, the water of His Word, so that when you are poked in the trial, the water of the Word will come out. Let it be true of us that we are like a tree. You see, Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 8, use the same imagery and remind us, not like Psalm 1, blessed is the man, but it puts us just in the opposite. And take a look. Jeremiah 17, 5 says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord, for he will be like a shrub in the desert. You notice shrubs, they're not trees. <laughs> uh, this is where you need to cue up the country music, to, you know, the da 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 and you see the sagebrush rolling. You, this is not a tree. The sagebrush rolling means it's not rooted, it's not grounded, it's not stable. It's He shall be like a shrub in the desert and will not see when prosperity comes. See some of the same wording from Psalm 1? But will live in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant. But Jeremiah goes on in verse 7 to say, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. And take a look at verse 8. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green. And it will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. What do you think? Do you think Jeremiah perhaps read Psalm 1? He did, along with many other godly people before you and me, to remind us how we can dig deep our roots into the Lord and His Word. I want to be steadfast like a tree. In fact, as we think about this steadfastness and, and the impressive tree that withstands the difficulties of life, 
firmly planted by the water. I'm reminded of one of the most precious gifts I've ever received. It was an inherited item from my great-grandmother. Uh, if anyone in the family history really knew and loved the Lord, uh, it was this great-grandmother, my mother's mother's mother. I inherited her Bible. It was large print, and that's something I'm increasingly appreciating. And at the end of the book of Malachi, I found her handwriting in which she wrote, I finished reading the books of the Old Testament on this date. And I fast forwarded to the end of the New Testament. I read at the end of Revelation, I finished reading the books of the New Testament on this date, about a year and a half later. And I thought, wow, look, any word that I read in Scripture has been read before by people who love the Lord. And look, any encouragement that I could receive from Scripture today has already encouraged countless other people. It should encourage you to know that any trial that you are facing today, look, if it's in a relationship, if it's a financial difficulty, if it's a health issue, others have suffered the same types of difficulties and trials before. And you know what makes the difference? God's word makes the difference. In his law, he meditates day and night. I hope that's how you meditate on God's word. I want to be steadfast like a tree. And because the alternative is not so good. We move from the positive encouragements about how to survive the storms of life in verses 1 through 3 to some negative examples of what happens if you don't. You see, not only is God's wisdom the path to survival, but wickedness is the path to suffering. We read in verses 4 through 6, the wicked are not so. In other words, they're not like the tree planted by rivers of water. Uh, they're not blessed. They are not so. In fact, some English translations front the negation and they say, not so the wicked. Just so you know, this is a contrast in verses 4 through 6 from verses 1 through 3. You have the negation right up front. Not so the wicked. Verse 4, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. The chaff. One of the places I love to take my students in Israel is to a little living history type farm in the city of Nazareth, there in the north, just out of the Jezreel Valley and up on the hilltop, you have Nazareth. Nazareth village has been put together by uh, various locals and international believers to present something like a biblical living history farm. And depending upon what grows naturally in the land of Israel, they could be harvesting various types of crops depending upon the season that you visit. So if you visit in the spring, you'll see the grain with barley and wheat. If you visit in the fall, you might see the grapes being harvested and so forth. And so it's great to take people multiple times a year. I never get tired of going. Even if I've been there five times in a given year, it's great to go to Nazareth Village and see uh, what's cooking at Nazareth Village? And on one occasion, I remember seeing their first century farmer dressed in his robes like a first century person would have been and using the type of tools they pound together to make into and, and weave together to make into a crude sort of wooden pitchfork. And he's throwing the grain up in the air just as a breeze would come by to take away the chaff. The chaff is that worthless grain refuse. It's the part that you don't use to make your bread. Maybe if, for those of us who are more city slicker types, who've not been to the farm to really hold kernels of grain and see the shell, the hull, the, the outside protective layer that is not what you want to eat, maybe we could compare this to a bowl of popcorn have you eaten a bowl of popcorn and you see at the bottom of the bowl after the nice white puffy pieces of popped corn 
are consumed, and, and not the kernels that are unpopped, but that other, like, thin, the stuff that could get stuck in your gums, and you gotta, that's the part that I'm talking about. Like, kids, don't try this at home, that when you see this bowl of, don't blow in that, you know, if you're going to do it, close your eyes first. Because that, that, that stuff, the chap, it goes, goes everywhere. It's worthless. No one is collecting all that chaff, all the popcorn refuse, and saying, oh, maybe I can make a batch of cookies out of this. You know, this is worthless stuff. Don't try that either. Um, the chaff is that which is good for nothing and is spoken of that way here in our text. You see, the wicked are not like a tree that is planted and rooted and prosperous and growing and yielding fruit and stable. No, the wicked are like the chaff. One pastor has put it like this. You're either a tree that grows or you're the chaff that blows. See, what kind of person are you? Are you grounded in the scriptures? Do your roots go down deep? Are you blessed because you are rooted in God and His gospel? Are you a tree? Or are you the chaff? Uh, verse 4 tells us that the wicked are like the chaff that the wind drives away. And here, being driven away is the first hint and the judgment that will now be described in the next verse. Verse 5, the wicked, therefore the wicked will not stand in the day of judgment or in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. These are two places to possibly be. It's one thing to be described as standing or surviving God's judgment. That's, that's good news. Not surviving God's judgment means that you'll be driven away. Remember the fateful words of Jesus when he described the judgment to come with the words, Depart from me, I never knew you. To be driven away. You see, the chaff are like this. They will not stand in the judgment, nor will sinners stand in the assembly of the righteous. Now, that's a place you want to be. The assembly of the righteous are those that will ultimately be gathered around God's throne, worshiping and praising Him, obeying Him, loving Him, and receiving His blessing. But the wicked will not be there. No, they're like the chaff that is driven away. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, verse 6 tells us, but the way of the wicked will perish. Here we are with the use of that wisdom terminology, the way, the path, the direction of your life that forces us to ask the question, which path are you on? You see, Psalm 1 that opened with such a beautiful word like blessed now closes with a frightful word, perish. It reminds us that there are ultimately only two ways to live. And the wicked, well, not only will they not survive God's judgment, and they will not share in God's salvation, but they will perish. This is the consistent warning of Scripture. The wicked will perish. It is... Part of that which motivates us to share the gospel with the lost because they are on a path that will lead to destruction. They will perish. It is also that which has caused many of us to awaken to the spiritual truth and to God's salvation call as His Spirit quickens within us a desire to flee His judgment, to avoid His punishment, to know that there is blessing to be enjoyed, while there is also punishment to be avoided. The wicked will perish. It reminds me of a sermon I've never preached, but it is my favorite sermon outline. It's a, title, a sermon titled, You're Gonna Die. And it's got three basic points. See if you can follow along. I've heard you're a quick congregation, but... See if you can follow this. The first point is, you're gonna die. 
The second point is you're going to die. And the third point is you're going to die. It's pretty clear, isn't it? I mean, you can't really avoid any of the message. You're going to die. And this is what is so clear about Scripture after Genesis chapter 3. God who created a perfect world and planted humans in it who had no sin. But when they were tempted, the enemy of our soul, who is the same one that tempts you and me today, one was deceived, the other chose to sin. And because of that, in Adam, even to this day, all die. And what is awaiting all of humanity? You're going to die. And when you do, you will either be like a tree planted by streams of water, or you'll be like the chaff that will be driven away. When we think about this pending judgment, we find that Psalm 1 is very much like the book of Proverbs. It provides us with two ways to live. Uh, there's the way of the righteous wise that is described as the straight path, the narrow path, the path that Jesus spoke about that said, few there be that find it. It's the path that leads to life. And then there is the way that is known as the crooked path. It's the way of the wicked fool that is crooked in its pathway and leads ultimately to death. There really are only two ways. There are not many ways. There are two that Scripture points to. There is the way of the righteous wise and the wicked fool, the way of blessing or the way of cursing, uh, the way of obedience or the way of rebellion, the way of the godly, the way of the ungodly, the way that is the path that leads to life, and the way that is the way to death. There is what we could call either salvation or judgment. And so, how about you? Will you stand in the day of judgment? What does being steadfast in the uncertainties of life have to do with this blessed description in Psalm 1? What does it have to do with you as an employee or as a grandmother or as a business owner or in your marriage or as a parent or as a child? What does it mean for you as a student or in times of plenty and in times of want? What does it mean for you to stand, to be steadfast, when you're stronger than you've ever been and you're in the prime of life? Or perhaps when difficulty in age is causing you to slow down, slower than you've ever been? I plead with you to understand that being steadfast through the storms of life is not a matter of you being a high-capacity individual. That you are stronger than others. That you have the power to be a survivor within yourself. That you are strong enough within yourself to keep yourself secure. That you can pull yourself up. This is not the biblical message. In fact, in John 10, verses 28 and 29, Jesus referred to his followers as those who are secure because of him. He put it like this, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. This is what it means to be secure to be secure like a tree that is rooted. Are you rooted? Are you in Jesus' hand, whose hand is in the Father's hand? Does he have hold of you? In the end, Psalm 1 points us to the ultimate blessed one, 
I mentioned Psalm 1 and 2 are like the double doors should, that open us to the Psalter. And there are many messianic psalms that point us to the descendant of David, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who is coming to give his life, the one who will be wounded and forsaken, the one who will be sold, the one who will be forsaken, but the one who will ultimately be victorious, the one who will rule on the throne of his father David. Psalm 1 points us to the son of Psalm 2 and its anointed one whose cross of death becomes a tree of life for all who trust in him. And it points us in Psalm 1 to the one who is the true vine to whom we cling, to the chief cornerstone, to the light of the world, to our deliverer, to our stronghold, to our sure foundation. He is the ultimate tree of life. But there are some false foundations to which we often choose to cling instead. And these are all such distractions, whether it's our hard work, our material possessions, our jobs, our relationships, our families, our status. But what happens when all of those things are gone? Remember what Job said in Job 121, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. All of these things in which we are tempted to trust, they will be proven to be the chaff that they always were. But the righteous and the wicked, you see, they're contrasted here for our benefit today. The righteous and the wicked experience the same trials of life, but they respond differently. Let the Lord be your strong tower. Be like those who throughout the ages have turned time and time again to the Psalter that point us time and time again to the Lord and His Word that point us ultimately to His Messiah so that you might survive not only the storms of this life but the judgment that is coming. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for Your Word today. Thank You for its reminder to us about your blessed salvation. We truly do want to be among the blessed men and women who will be around your throne, who are worshiping you now in spirit and in truth, who are preparing for the judgment that is to come, who are those who gladly bow the knee now so that we will not be among those who will be forced to bow when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Let us confess you now, we pray with great joy and blessing. May we worship you in spirit and in truth, even calling on the name of the Lord so that we might be saved, the name of Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.